My name is David Ades. I'm a poet based in Sydney and the host of a monthly poetry podcast reading series called Poets Corner in association with West Words in Parramatta in Sydney's West. West Words is Western Sydney's literature development organisation. Poets Corner is part of West Words public programming that celebrates the richness, diversity and insight that literature offers. Especially in these times, we thank the ongoing support of Create New South Wales, the Cultural Fund of Copyright Australia, City of Parramatta Council, Blacktown City Council and Campbelltown City Council, as well as the many project partners that have enabled us to continue to provide opportunities to writers and audiences. We hope that this new world will see a sharing and a closeness of spirit. Each month, I invite a poet to read poems and talk about them for an hour or so, or two, or three, around a the theme of the poet's choice. Our guest poet today is John Kinsella, who will be reading poems and talking with me on the theme of environmental, human and animal rights through poetry. But first, an acknowledgement of country. I'm recording this from Beecroft in Sydney. John is recording from Germany. I'd like to pay my respects to and acknowledge the elders, past, present and emerging of the Wallamida people, the traditional custodians of the land in Beecroft, and of the Baladong Noongar peoples, the traditional custodians of the land at Jam Tree Gully in the Western Australian wheat belt where John normally lives and writes, and to acknowledge also that they are the sovereign owners of their land, which has never been ceded or given up. John Kinsella lives on Baladong Noongar land at Jam Tree Gully in the Western Australian wheat belt and went to high school on Nyamaji land in Geraldton and has also lived in the United States, the United Kingdom, Ireland, currently in Germany and in other zones. His recent publications include the poetry volumes Super Vivid, The Pastoralism, published by Vagabond in 2021, The Ascension of Sheep, Collected Poems, Volume 1, 1980 to 2005, published by UWAP in 2021. More recently, Ha Shakir, Collected Poems, Volume 2, 2005 to 2014, also published by UWAP, Volume 3 of that uh, series of um, Collected Poems is scheduled for publication in 2024. Story collections include Pushing Back, Transit Lounge 2021, and Old Growth, Transit Lounge 2017. And recent novels are Lucida Intervalla, UWAP 2018, and Hollow Earth, Transit Lounge 2019. His memoir, Displaced, A Rural Life, was published by Transit Lounge in 2020, and his Legibility and Anti-Fascist Poetics was published by Palgrave in 2022. His trilogy of activist poetic books with Manchester University Press saw completion in 2021 with the appearance of Beyond Ambiguity, Tracing Literary Sites of Activism. He is Emeritus Professor of Literature and Environment at Curtin University and the recipient of many literary awards. He is a frequent collaborator with other writers, musicians, artists and activists, and frequently and recently with Kwame Dawes and Charmaine Paper Talk Green. Hi, John, and welcome to Poets Corner. Hi, David. It's great to be with you. It's great to be able to do this, uh, doing this at an unusual time zone for us, hence the, the lights in the background. Um, you're going to be reading poems from your recent book, uh, The Argonautica in Landica, uh, that speak to your theme of environmental, human and animal rights through poetry. Uh, but the theme has been present in your work for a very, very long time. I would be interested to know if you would say a little about how the theme first emerged in your writing and how it has evolved over the years. Yeah, well, it really emerged in, in terms of uh, publication in 1983 when I had a chapbook out under a different name, under the name John Haywood, which is the name I sort of uh, adopted for a few years early on, called The Frozen Sea. And that was largely concerned with... Uh, rural kind of uh, colonial presence and the problems of um, damage to the land and damage to country. And it extended into, I hoped it extended into kind of psychological kind of positions as well. Um, I spent a lot of time in my childhood and youth on um, farms. And I saw a lot of the kind of, uh, well, basically well, through over clearing of land or through just clearing of land, really. There's no such thing as over clearing. It's clearing, uh, clearing of land, um, you know, salinity sort of rise from the soil and and basically wastelands come into come into um, being it deeply distressed me as a kid. 
I had a strange kind of um, almost obsessive um, uh, interest in those places. I used to go to them a lot. I was interested in damaged country. Um, I wasn't quite sure why. As time went on and um, I left behind some of my earlier habits, you know, the kind of hunting, fishing kind of thing of my early life into a kind of, I guess, environmentalist, vegan, animal rights activism. It was a, it was actually quite a profound shift. It happened in very specific ways through very specific uh, events in my life um, where I said, hey, you know, this is not what I want to be doing um, and, and made shifts. Um, so I don't know, it's always been part of it. It's really how my psyche formed. It, and as I said, they, these events of really confronting my wrongs in, in the places I perceived them um, when I was in my teenage years, especially, and through to my very early 20s, um, they, they were sh profound shifts and um, they they made poetry. So for me, poetry has always been intrinsically connected to environment um, intrusion, um, colonialism. You know, I'm part of that whole colonial machine and I've never for a moment tried to evade the responsibility. I don't think of, you know, being held culpable for that. The question becomes how one redresses and addresses the problem and how one does it without appropriation and, you know, with respect. Um, and that's really, those have been my life's concerns and they go back to my, um, to my childhood. Yeah. Mm. So there are three strands to your theme, uh, environmental, human, and animal rights. Can you say something about your understanding of the connections and tensions between these three st strands? Well, yeah, this is one of the things that um, has so bothered me, actually, over the last 40, 50 years, is the um, inability of um, activists to be fully intersectional. So you will get um, occasionally, I'm not saying it's, it's not a generic thing, but you will get some very committed environmentalists who seem not to understand that you cannot, um, uh, especially talking about a colonised space like Australia, you cannot be an environmentalist and not also a deep respecter of Indigenous rights and knowledge. Uh, those two things are not separable. They, mm. are, they share a knowledge base and they share repercussions. Um, damaging the environment is damaging, um, you know, country, and um, disrespecting uh, indigenous knowledge is not understanding that environment, and so on and so on. I mean, you know, this is much discussed, well attested, and indigenous peoples have uh, articulated it um, since the first contact um, with uh, colonial intrusion. So it's not like it's uh, a mystery, but I do find it quite strange that. Um, many, not many, but some, and some prominent environmentalists still try and separate those things off. They may pay lip service to it, but in reality, they don't actually do the do. They don't actually follow it through. Yeah. Um, the, on the other hand, I don't see how anyone can be um, a rights activist in terms of people's rights without taking into consideration it's uh, the environmental kind of uh, uh, overall picture, the, the biosphere. Uh, we're all connected to it. We all have a responsibility to it. And we all suffer the consequences of the um, ill treatment that we meet out on the environment. So these things are inseparable for me. They are they are very tangled together. But people do try and break them off. Um, and I don't think that's possible. And the third component, which, which is even more complex in many ways, um, uh, animal rights. And I'm often challenged by um, fellow, fellow animal rights activists for my defense of, um, I use quote marks around the word defense because as a pacifist, every word I use, I kind of try and qualify. It's, but you're a poet, you know, that's a, a thing. That's what language is. Mm -hmm. um, people say, well, why do you put scare quotes around the word? And that's because a word isn't a static, um, stagnant thing. It's an active thing. And we need to be conscious of this. But anyway, um, people ask me why I uh, say that it's none of my business, which I wholeheartedly believe it's none of my business, to discuss, say, um, the interaction between Indigenous peoples and animals um, and how uh, uh, on country um, people uh, interact with animals, the totemic relationships, the um, hunting relationships, those kind of things. I don't see them as my business. Um, I see animal rights and looking after the well-being of animals in every context I possibly can 
as my business. I think that I have a responsibility to be an advocate for animals. But I also know that um, the best way of respecting animals is also to respect human cultures around animals as well and uh, to try and understand them. Now, you take, for example, you know, the um, when I was younger as a vegan animal rights activist, I was very proselytizing, very um, in people's faces. I mean, serious. I've been a vegan now for 38 years and uh, really in people's faces. And I was there. Wherever there was, I was there. Yeah. That kind of thing. Now, I'm there still, but I'm there in a different way. I'm not there in a berating or, um, you know, belittling kind of way. I'm there in an advocacy way of saying, look, there's another way we could do this. The yeah. animals are autonomous beings. They are, you know, they are, um, they have agency, they have sentience, they have, they have rights. And those rights are very similar, um, if not the same in most instances to human rights, to my mind, of course. And so on. So it's a discussion and it's a discussion I keep having and I'm very dedicated and committed to. But I also know that there are limits to how and where I can go. But that doesn't mean any less concern for the for those creatures I'm trying to advocate for. In fact, in some ways, it makes me even more determined. I spend many hours a day working on it and I have done for decades. And so all of the, these three things you mentioned are very co-determined they're very tangled together um but you've also and so they're highly intersectional but you also have to be able to uh separate bits off um when you're acting in a particular way at a particular time so you know it's nothing's easy <laughs> it's no as Derrida said you know it's, we need complex thinking and it is complex thinking there are simple answers but the thinking around those simple answers can be really complex. So yeah, I don't know if that sums it up, but it's well, a it's, yeah, it's a big it's picture. Interesting. I mean, it's I think a lot of us miss the nuance, and that's the that's not just to do with this issue, but with a lot of issues, people see things in black and white and and don't see the complexity of the nuance. But it requires a lot of work to see the complexity and the nuance, and not everybody is able to do that or willing to do that. Um, so that's yeah, it's interesting to hear your take on it. Um, in one of the first poems in the book, not one that you're going to read uh, today, but the, the poem Oracle, is is the line, future slips into past, and that's what this voyage is all about, isn't it? What was the genesis of this book? Is it something that has gestated for years? Uh, well, I've been, uh, like with most things, I get very obsessed about certain things, and um, the Argonautica, uh, Apollonius of Rhodes, um, uh, Argonautica, has obsessed me since I was a kid. I mean, in fact, I got an early, like um, at primary school, one of those um, the scholastic books, whatever they did, they sold around schools. I got an early version of that, um, uh, you know, that was sold for kids basically. And so the story always, I got one of those for um, uh, the Odyssey as well, Ulysses. Um, uh, and they had quite a big effect on me. I got them when they, I don't even remember those things. I mean, they went around schools and they um, kind of, you could buy five for two dollars or something. But anyway, it was one of those, I think, or in that sort of context, if I'm, I might be getting it slightly wrong, but I read an early version of the story, the myth, if you like, um, when I was very, very young. So, you know, I'm eight years old or whatever it was. And that really interested me. And then obviously, as I grew older, I read the, the, the Penguin translation, as one does, and, and so on. And so it's been a, a long-term interest. Um, this book really started in 2016. I was crossing, um, because I eschew flying as much as I can, um, and entirely in Australia when I'm there, is that... Um, I was crossing from Ireland to Wales on the ferry. And so anytime I had to go across to England for work reasons, I'd go across on the ferry. And I did a really, really, really rough crossing. Um, I mean, you know, it was a force nine or force 10 gale. Usually they don't sail and they shouldn't have, but they did. And the, the waves were coming up past the portals. I mean, literally up on the top decks. So it really was quite concerning. And I thought, geez, you know, <laughs> So I started writing the Argonautica and um, in my own version. And then on the way back on the ferry trip, which was a calmer one, on the way back, I um, 
picked it up. Then I left it aside for some time. And I was working a lot on um, uh, issues around nature reserves in um, the southwest of Western Australia. And that particular kind of want a better word project was both looking at um, the vulnerability um, of those fragmented um, pieces of bushland to farming around them and other pressures like mining. Um, another was a kind of data survey, if you like, of the animals and plants that were managing to persist there in those places. And the third was looking at the um, kind of colonial context of um, nature reserves and so on. So I was working on stuff around that. And I thought that um, as I was going from one to the other, this is a real journey. This is a, like, you know, uh, surrounded by sheep farms and in between are these nature reserves. And it's, it's, you know, the golden fleece is everywhere, but what I'm searching for is not that. So it was a kind of inverted thing going on. And I took that as the uh, motivation to really return to the um, Argonautica and the Argonautica material. And I wanted to, because in the Argonautica, of course, there's a long inland river journey in it on the return home um, with the golden fleece. And I wanted to uh, encapsulate that in terms of the whole movement, the colonial movement and the consequences and damage and impacts of that colonial movement through uh, where I come from. And so it became the Argonautica Inlandica. Um, it has references to all sorts of other sea places around the world, but it's also an inland Western Australian thing as well. And so that's that was its genesis. And then I spent um, you know a few years just working away at it and uh, pegging away and um, shaping it because it was, the original version is quite considerably, is often the case with my work, quite considerably longer than the published version, probably another 80 pages. And uh, I wanted to whittle it down into a into a shape that almost had um, not only the narrative of movement and the uh, overtones of the original or undertones, if you prefer, of the original, but also its own narrative. And I hope in the end that was shaped I mean, people might say it's a very tangential narrative, but it's there. Mm. And a lot of time was spent sort of sculpting it down to that shape and better one that better suited publication. Mm. How, how would you describe your book, uh, the relationship of your book to the Argonautica? Um, you know, is, is it a response, a reworking, an extension, a modern day version? Well, it's or... all of those things. Well, yeah, it's all those things, David. It is, it is a response, very much so. And quite literally, it responds to, um, you know, uh, as you go through the Argonautica, it goes through here and references across all the way through. So you can actually track them next to each other. Um, it's an extension in the sense that it's uh, it's a rejection of the quest. Mm. It's a rejection of the kind of um, the argosy of going and collecting the goods. It's a, So it's a, an anti-colonial text, I hope. It should be. Um, that's what it's intended to be um so and it's a dialogue with it it's a and in many ways it's actually an argument with it see a lot of i work with a lot of um so-called classical texts um and you know i've called that templating in the past where i take a another work the divine comedy for example and completely rework it while making a uh, a version that correlates to the original so you can read them against each other if you wish but um the principle behind this isn't to um, occupy um, the space that's already occupied. It is to dialogue. It is to argue. Um, it is to try and understand the way as time goes on, um, a literature becomes politically um, irrelevant or retrograde or reinvented um, or culturally different, but in some ways still echoes into the future. So you've got this whole thing of, you know, the past, present, and future all interacting. I think if people manage to pull off a, um, an effective poem, that all the, um, the whole of time is present in the poem. Um, even if you're talking about a specific event of some lousy politician doing something lousy, and it's so located in the moment, there are many of those poems, and there should be, um, is that uh, they still, if they're working at their sort of maximum efficiency as a poem, they will reach across time, even if the politics have changed and the mm. con, you know, social conditions have changed and so on. And so I'm very interested in these things. And I, I try and um, consider how language will change, how what I intend something to be will not necessarily be the way it's received in 10, 20, 
um, if you're lucky enough, 30 or 40 years, if anyone's bothering to read what you've written, which they probably won't, but you still think those things when you write. Um, I know people say they don't think those things when they write, but I think that people do think about um, reception and they do think about what the poem will do. And I think about it because it worries me. It worries me that, you know, I've got a very specific kind of politics I come out of. You know, it's a very left politics, it's a pacifist politics. And I would hate for someone, hate quotation marks again, but I would be very upset to think that someone would um, read my work in X number of years and, and read sort of um, aspects I was opposed to into the work. So that's why the exchange keeps going. That's why I talk about it so much. That's why I write so many critical books around it because these issues really bother interest and um, sort of drive me as well. Yeah. Um, uh, how, how would you situate this book in your own oeuvre and, and your on, in, ongoing exploration of this and other activist themes in your work? Well, it's directly connected with a series of books that go right back. Um, because of this templating thing, um, a book like... Uh, no, a book like The Silo, which came out in the mid-90s, 1995, which was really templated on Beethoven's Sixth Symphony, The Pastoral. Uh, and it's a unwriting of that in the uh, context of ecological destruction wrought by European farming methods and colonialism. And so it's a contestation of that. That's what that book is and was intended to be. Uh, deeply, um, on one level, enamored am I of, uh, of they, all Beethoven, but Beethoven Sixth in particular, but I also wrestle with it and resist it and uh, see it as a I mean, kind of intrusive kind of controlling text. So there's an argument that goes on, um, that, that tension between admiring and being also bothered by something. So I think that uh, it goes back probably at least to that book and probably before. Um, so the, the mid nineties, then, then there's the new Arcadia in 2005, which is, um, uh, a, a kind of reworking of Sir Philip Sidney's um, Arcadia um, and uh, old and new Arcadia, uh, two versions, and so on. And so, and then there's the Divine Comedy, and and so on, and so on through my work. There's this, there are these arguments with other texts. So I think this book fits into that sequence of books, um, and where it environmentally fits is it tries to, um, rather than look at the um, Australian environment in either a context of uh, something separated off, which is always the discourse around Australia, that what I call the quarantining discourse of separating it off from a uh, conceptualising world. And there are reasons for that. There are reasons because of the colonial intrusion trying to incorporate it into the world. So there are reasons for it. But on the other hand, there are also negative reasons. And they're the reasons of, you know, the Fortress Australia kind of white bastion stuff, which is so frightening and so offensive, is also in there as well in some of this discourse. And I resist that with every every particle and fibre of being I have. Um, and I think that that kind of, um, in this the linking across to the world from the local. So it's that philosophy I've kind of expounded for a few decades, what I call international regionalism, of a, respecting a regional integrity, looking at it very closely, talking about it, but also contextualizing within world events and so on. This attempts to do that in a variety of ways. Um, whether it does it effectively, I, I don't know. That's not really my ultimate issue, the uh, effectiveness. It's the consequences that interest me. Will it have negative consequences? In which case, I um, it would make me ashamed. Um, if it has positive consequences, then I feel um, affirmed to go on and continue uh, in the same vein further down the track in some different way. And it sounds like it's a very personal um, contest of ideas and, and wrestling um, that goes that permeates all of the all of the work. Um, how hard is it for you to make that accessible to readers? Oh, this is the this is the the, the big um, non monetary question. Uh, I don't like I'm an anarchist. Don't like money. Money just bad stuff. Anyway, I divert. Um, you know the thing about it is, when all is said and done, um, 
what I hope to achieve is very different. And this is a very roundabout way of answering your question is what I hope to achieve is very, very uh, distant from myself. I mean, that, this sounds absurd because I've just given a sort of manifesto of the self in the world, but it's actually really secondary. Um, I'm not particularly interested in uh, what, what I am or who I am. And if I'm, you know, obviously I embrace life and want to be alive, but my not being in existence really affects nothing. And I don't see any role for myself in the grand scheme of existence. I only see an advocacy in the time I'm working in. And I only see um, this as really an extension of my activism. I think poetry is incredible. I grew up with it. It's the way I speak. I think um, I talk in it. Um, now, that doesn't mean it's any good, but it means that that's what I do. For good or bad, that's what I do. It's how I think. It's how I was taught to think. And it's how I process things. I process things metaphorically. And even when I'm writing critical material, I tend to sort of pass it through um, a metaphorical figurative matrix that comes out in its own unusual way. But um, so there's a real separation of self from the, um, the objects that come out of um, this creative process. So it's very personal, yes but it's also incredibly impersonal as well. And I suppose the in getting that into that roundabout way, this takes me into that space of um, seeing poetry as quite a utilitarian thing in a non-capitalist um, way, uh, as being quite a functional thing. I actually really believe poetry matters, David. I really do. I'm one of these people who, I don't think it matters because it's it's good to read or nice and we find things out about ourselves. That's good too. No problem with that. I think it's important because I've seen it change things. I have seen change come from poetry. I think it's an incredibly effective tool. And um, I also don't believe there's any one type of poetry that's better than that. I don't believe any of that. I don't believe there are any hierarchies in poetry. I think that um, the person who's writing in cliches for the first time in rhyming jingles, um, in a way, has as much to say as the, um, you know, the, the sort of profound late career poet who's worked through all the and, and got rid of all the, the so-called dross and is writing you know in a way that other writers would expect them to write um i don't actually differentiate i think that um they're as relevant as each other and they're really part of a big journey that we're all kind of <laughs> heaped into whether we like it or not so that's a very roundabout way of answering your question but the answer's in there my, my conceit is that everyone's a poet. I'm sure of it. Whether that I think it's a, true. Yeah. But I think, David, I think you're absolutely right. I do believe that. And what really bothers me is the gatekeeping stuff that says that some people are and some people aren't. Yeah. I really, really find it offensive. And I also find the critical culture that uses demeaning, putting down and ridicule as repulsive. Um, critical culture should be trying to find the commonality, the links, the differences, and trace them and um, understand why they're like that, not to ridicule and put down. Um, it's always been a thing for me. I, um, I for years um, in the late 90s, up till about 2001, oh, no, further than that, 2003, um, I was the uh, poetry critic for The Observer. And I know that some of my early reviews, I just look back and shudder because they were just nasty, not intended to be, unwittingly nasty. They were nasty because I thought that the way of, um, you know, pulling a text to bits and to uh, say what's what was to show the flaws and compare them to the successes, so-called and so on. And not a lot of the reviews I'm quite proud of, but there are three I can think of that um, I look back and I think that was just, you know, not generous. And it was also through not being generous, it was lacking insight. Um, it was lacking a fundamental insight in those on those occasions. And so I learned early on as a critic that um, there's nothing wrong with making critical points. There's nothing wrong with you know saying something, say it's politically offensive, is politically offensive or whatever. But there has to be a kind of deep respect that everyone is a poet and everyone's expressing something through language. And if you're criticizing anything, you're criticizing the language itself. And that's a whole different debate. And anyway, mm. I went off again then, didn't I? Sorry. That's all right. It's wonderful stuff. 
Um, I, th I think you've probably answered this next question to some extent, but I'll, I'll ask it anyway. Do you regard your poetry as a form of interrogation uh, of themes, of assumptions, of paradigms, of consequences? Well, I, I would say probably more than an interrogation um, and not an exploration either for obvious reasons, but maybe um, a kind of investigation. Um, I think that would be the most apt word because I'm really interested in discovering things. I'm really interested in showing things as um, they can be shown to the best of my ability. So it's, I think there is a critical uh, kind of uh, a desire for a critical faculty, whether I have one or not, it's a, <laughs> a moot point, but I desire one. Um, that critical fa faculty fits within the context of what I was just saying. Um, but uh, yes, I would say investigative. I am trying to investigate things. I'm trying to discover things. I, I, it's a kind of um, a science, hopefully without consequences. Um, in you know, I, I live amidst so many consequences of just being who I am, and I and recognizing those, which is not easy. It's easy to say you recognize something that's a consequence in yourself, but it's really hard to live, you know, in a in a better way around it. Um, but uh, yeah, I'd say investigative, and they're all they're all investigating something, and they're all considering something. Poems never exist. Um, for good or bad again on their own for me they're all connected to other poems i've written and um you know people have remarked at various times how i'll look at the same subject again and again from different angles but you know I, i'm not i think that's actually what i should be doing and i think that's what um my purpose as a writer is not to um necessarily always come up with the new um you know, the eureka moment but to actually um, find something uh, in a different way and find it again in a different way and then understand it in a different way because you know that's that whole flow and movement thing rather than the stasis thing that interests me because I think that uh, we've constantly got to be mentally moving um, in order to uh, understand um, and deal with things around us. Yeah. yeah, look, I think I said to you that you know when I read this book a couple of times, the first time I read all the individual poems and the second time uh, I read it, it was like one long poem with, with yeah, thank all, you. all conversing uh, with one, all, all the aspects conversing with one another. That was, that was the feeling that I got. Um, well, that pleases me greatly because that's exactly how I hope it will be read. I mean, you can read them all as individual poems. There's no doubt about that, but they are all interconnected and they're mm. all, and they're written um, in certain, they're written almost in bands. Um, they're like, uh, if you're looking at a say a spectrum they're in sort of various uh, bands of the spectrum and uh, they come together to make a spectrum and that's how they're composed too so you'll i'll be on a particular series of writing say like the Medea poems in there they're written in a very paired mostly in a fairly paired back kind of way and even where you've got four line stands the kind of chunkier versions the um the language is still really hyper condensed is that um that that was a particular band of thinking within this. At the same time, there was another band, usually to do with going into nature reserves, where there's a lot of information and data I wish to impart, and they're much bigger, chunkier, longer line poems. Mm. They're more discursive, um, have more of a chatty edge to them, and I want them to be like that. So I think these different bands come together. To, it's like with um, if you read a novel, um, you know. Even if it's something like um, uh, Finnegan's Wake, which is either complete difference in every word and line, or all the same in another way across the whole, depending on how you want to read it, is that um, there is a constant in any um, fiction construct. There's a constant um, shift uh, in that compels you to keep moving through the book. It's not they're never static. Uh, even the most experimental novel isn't static. And I don't want the book of poetry to be static either. I want it to move. And I want to move through those bands, almost like the conversation. So form becomes part of the conversation as well as the content. Mm. In my reading, um, and it's it's partly to do with how prolific you've been over the years, there is a, there's, and it's partly to do with your activist concerns, there is a furious urgency at work in your poetry. Um, you, you've touched on this, but I'd like you to uh, expand on it. What do you think poetry can do by engaging with this theme of environmental, human, and animal rights through poetry? Oh, it can it can do things. 
it really can. I've seen it do things. I've written about it. I've seen it stop bulldozers. I've seen it uh, change um, whole ways discussions take place around a particular patch of land. You know, I've been involved in many, many, many environmental um, sort of protests and events across my life. I'm dating back to when I was 18. And the first one I went to was um, uh, the, the destruction of the bushland and the back part of what's now Murdoch University. Um, Murdoch University was expanding then and I was involved in process then. That's the first time I ever came across the experience of stopping bulldozers by yelling my very um, uh, raw poems of 18 years of age at the bulldozer drivers and one of them getting off and having a chat. And we ended up having a long chat about unionism. And um, he was a unionist and I supported unionism. And so we found some common ground. He was destroying the bush. I was trying to stop him destroying the bush. I looked like a wild person. He looked very conventional for the time. And um, we found common ground. And um, I realized there and then that forevermore, my politics um, and activism would have to be um, understanding, and it took years before it fully became the case, I must say, first few years were pretty rocky, um, is, and also in those early years, I was dealing with addiction issues and so on up until I was about 32, and that always made things complex in itself, but um, and then I got sober forevermore, and things became a little easier to keep consistent, but I learned in that early phase that to interact with people, to converse with them, not to always just be the opposition, but to be the never give in opposition on one level, but also just to be a fellow person on the other and understand that this guy, you know, as he saw it in 1981, was going home to his uh, family and feeding them from his point of view. You know, it was a very patriarchal kind of <laughs> early 1980s vision of thing, but that was um, what we we're talking about and I had a long conversation about it. And, you know, there are politics attached to that too. Yeah. And you have to create an intersectional politics. I mean, you know, the intersectionalism as an idea didn't really come into mode until after that, you know, through um, uh, African-American kind of legal actions and legal discussion um, at a later date, or around that period, in fact. Um, but it, uh, it was something conceptually that really interested me, that um, nothing is separable off. And that poetry really is part of this mosaic of activity and action. So early on, I discovered that poetry can actually do something. And I've really remained convicted in that. I've only seen it more and more. Sure, it's had people attack me. I've been physically maimed. Um, I have been you know, dealt with serious death threats and all sorts of things out of poetry uh, as activism. I've dealt with a lot of public you know, maligning and put down and some you know, critical shredding and various other things that's part of the course. You know, that's people's right. That's fine. As long as they don't threaten people, that's fine by me. I, I can take that. Um, that's part of what I do. Um, and that that is a whole for me. That is a part of a, a holistic view of an activist poet is that um, you've got to believe that it can do something. And I do. And I've seen it. And yeah, so when I I produce a lot, you, you know, that's true. I'm the first to admit it. It's not deniable, but I I really feel I do it for a purpose, and I don't I don't feel like oh you know, oh, there's another book out. What am I going to get from that? I I honestly it doesn't. I don't process things like that. I process it as what can it do, and it might not necessarily do it now, but maybe it'll do it in a while. Um, so I'm not particularly hung up on the uh, concept of immediacy. Um, I think um, environmental actions and rights actions have to be immediate. You have to be there at the time but, and poetry exists in its moment. But I also think that poetry can do things later as well. Um, and that's an interesting thing with my bulldozer poem, which was written for the Row 8 um, highway protests. Um, has since, and I've made available for anyone who wants to use it, since got multiple lives in other protest events being read at machines and so on in other countries. And that pleases me, although obviously it's very specific to um, the uh, the wetlands, Belia wetlands well, that it refers to with animal life mentioned and so on. People adapt it to suit their 
home environment. Now there's a whole politics in that because of colonial implications and so on, but that's for other people to work out if they use it. And um, hopefully they have enough respect to take that on board. But so, you know, I um, it's, it's everything to me, the activism and the poetry. And I do believe poetry does make things happen. And it happens in so many ways we don't see as well. Mm. OK, um, I think we should probably read some poems. Okie doke. Let's have a look here. So the first one I'm going to read is actually a long one. Well, I say long, it's two pages. Um, and uh, written in Pindarian stanzas, um, which in English is an interesting thing. I'm very interested in uh, formal issues and, you know, I mess around a lot with form and I want form always to be generative. I want it to do something. I don't want it just to exist as, you know, oh, that's been done in that. It's got to actually, you know, the sound and sense has to be echoed in the form or resist the form or undo the form or something. But anyway, so this is called Land, Sea, Land, out of Pindar's take on Jason and the Argonauts. And that's the other thing about the Argonauts written Landica. It uses various other um, sources of the um, uh, Argonauts story. Uh, as well. It's not just um, uh, Apollonius of Rhodes' version. There are other versions, Flaccus and so on, used in here and Pindar and so on. Okay. Land, sea, land, out of Pindar's take on Jason and the Argonauts. Sometimes we see large boats being towed far inland and wonder where they can be going, assuming they will eventually find a sea or be lodged in permanent dry dock, red dust corking their planks holes singing dry winds. The trade routes of the mining economy. Sometimes we hear the voice of Medea, a voice of city and elements, of protest and conspiracy, it being impossible to separate each thread and label them. But we won't put a face to words, form an identikit. Watching over the loading of ships that would carry away coastal and inland beaches, I heard the stroke of oars against an industrially treated sky, ships at harbour wearing many masts, trying to keep their balance. I'm not sure whose voice this is, but fear it might be my own. I was there as the ships loaded mineral sands in sequence, took here away to there, claimed Argosy as reason for their existence. Sailors asked me to call sex workers. I was very young then, just out of school. I had planned an escape from the state via ship to be told I couldn't do so without a ticket. I looked out to sea so I could reach inland. I was caught up in the aporia of Oceanus and I am still haunted by navigation lights or by the fact that my grandfather, lost in fog, turned his boat towards Karnak Island as marker, where Jagen was held prisoner sharing language with supporter Robert Menley Lyon and from where he escaped in a dinghy. On river, river swamp, and in the sound, all was twisted in my hand when I was tired. There was nothing for it but to keep the stroke, to rise and fall towards the shorelines or farm dams. I remember each paperbark tree that's no longer tapping water and dolphins that weren't sick. The prediction came before the question and forest beyond beaches was felled to make way for houses. Sheep that had been grazing pastures that had been wetlands, slaughtered to make way for light industry, fleeces on racks at Rob Jetty Abattoir, North Coogee. I wasn't swept overboard, but slipped while rounding the cabin in the early hours of the morning, just as we were about to pass eastwards under Canning Bridge, sitting on the engine cover to warm into the place where two rivers meet, the sea mouth far behind us, Mulloway running beneath the keel. My mother and Jackie were at home by the river, but my father was up in the Pilbara working the tr with trucks that carry ore and later salt. The bulk carriers brooding off the coast, a cyclone keeping them from port. Or later, on a small boat caught near Africa Reef, when big waves set to capsize us, turning to face a source of waves, rising high as we sailed into them, further away from the harbour and safety. My father had remarried by then, had another son, a third, and on their lounge room floor was the hide of a massive bull, a legacy of stations and mines in iron ore mountains. We went with him to deep fresh waters in Yinjabandi country, far in from mangroves without acknowledging the sacred serpent, 
I do so now, and this is my purpose. I really like um, starting this um, podcast with this poem because it it um, it contains so many of the threads that run through the book. Um, but I would want to start off by asking you a little bit about Pindar and uh, his involvement in the story of Jason and the Argonauts because on my reading, and I don't know much about Pindar, um, it cropped up in his fourth Pythian ode, but that, yep. that predates the Argonautica, doesn't it? Yes, and this is the uh, interesting thing. Of course, this we're talking, we're talking myths, and we're talking, uh, you know, uh, things compiled across a vast period of time. It's like with, um, you know, the urtext of the um, the Iliad, Homer's Iliad. Mm -hmm. Of course, you know, really, it's very likely many voices, or at least some, not just this entity we call Homer, the the um, you know the uh, the bard who who uh, you know, oral tradition who sang the poem as it passed through time it accumulated and changed and it comes out of that oral tradition the same with you know any of the um sort of the major greek myths mm. um you know they have the same kind of origins they they accrue and they alter and they're reinvented and that's what fascinates me and that's why i also see a kind of role to play um as a poet in this material um Though it's culturally not mine in the sense, you know, I'm I'm not Greek. Um, though the first, you know, uh, second place I went to when I was young and left Australia was Greece. I was very, very, very interested in um, Greek culture and um, in specifically ancient history. Um, I um, felt feel that because of the the whole problem of Western imperialism, Western colonialism, you know, it uses as its Renaissance template, um, the Latin and the Greek, it uses um, you know, ancient Rome and through ancient Rome, ancient Greece. And so I feel in part of addressing that problem that I was educationally part of and brought up within that whole Western subjectivity thing um, is I feel a kind of almost purpose in going back and realigning and retelling the myths because they're still being passed on. We're still passing them on and retelling them. Um, within a certain cultural kind of register and then also in other cultural registers as well so uh yes the the dating of these things is uh open and they are accruing and growing and that's what and so one of the versions i used in here the um is a latin telling of the you know probably largely derived from the obviously the greek telling of uh, apollonius but the um it has its own agendas and its own politics of the time and it has variations um and yeah those slippages and differences are really interesting i love the same things being told differently and it's like writing uh, a poem about the same subject in a different way so yeah that's why i drew on pinda also the whole ode thing the whole um mode of address the kind of um the, uh, the element of apotheosis that goes into um uh, lifting um, the poetry becomes something above life. And of course, the irony in this particular poem, which is one of my favorite poems I've ever written, incidentally, uh, because I worked it a very long time. It was revised and revised and revised and revised. Is that, and why I like it is because it ironizes that kind of ode process. It's almost an anti ode. And it looks at all the bits of uh, colonial presence that uh, make the ode fail. And um, tries to weave them together into a personal narrative of literally um leaving home and going into the world as the you know the usual read the passage goes um that kind of thing so it's all mixed in there so it's highly personal but it's also trying to deal with all those other issues but yeah time displacement very interesting and very important and what i'm trying to do and look whatever the origins of the myths they're now they're now global and in a they sense are. what you're doing is perpetuating or continuing the tradition of the myth telling yes and and the, and as i said the issue of what's available for us to use and not it's within the kind of uh cultural register that i was um kind of brought up in um uh, was very saturated in this stuff and uh you know my mum when i was a kid was doing ancient history at university after she divorced she went to university and 
you know, she uh, trained in, and one of her um, majors was ancient history. And um, so, you know, I was surrounded by this stuff um, and it's a logical extension. And I've already mentioned the early kind of condensed version of the story I had, which was you know, basically some person sitting in a big factory building, knocking these things off to plug to kids. Um, so they so they knew about that Western kind of stuff, um, that whole kind of colonial project, which uh, is such a problem. But yes, it is. I am part of a long line of doing this and, you know, and there's many people doing it simultaneously. Mm. The uh, One of the things that I enjoyed about this poem was its scope. Um, it ranges from Greece to Western Australia, from Medea to sex workers, from your grandfather to yourself. So it's working on a, on a personal level as well as a historical one and a mythological one. From Indigenous resistance fighter Jagan to Scottish-born settler advocate uh, Robert Menley Lyon. What was your aim in drawing all these disparate sources together in one poem? See, that is actually probably my modus operandi. That is probably what I do. Pull, uh, this is the, the big conceit, if you like, <laughs> of my work. I pull all these very disparate things together and I process them in a way that allows me to just make sense of what on earth is going on around me. Um, it's it's how I process the world. And um, that's why there's a lot of, you know, a lot of my poems are information heavy, but it's not because I'm just trying to stack them with details. It's because I'm actually trying to process those details in a figurative way and find other ways through to potentially other answers or other paths or whatever it is. Um, so yeah, they're, they're drawn in out of necessity. Um, and a poem that's working with a form is a really interesting way of doing that because you've got a, you've got a template there that you're wrestling with one way or another and messing around with it, messing it up and all the rest of it. And then in discovering new ways of doing things while you're doing it. But that kind of bouncing against form I find uh, very useful for processing um, a lot of information. Yeah. Um, then if you if you can put it into a kind of some kind of story um, or narrative, um, then you can hopefully bring people, they'll follow through with it and just follow the storyline if nothing else. So uh, yeah, it, you know, it's an interesting poem for me, that one as well, just because of what I know I was trying to do and what it may or may not do. Um, so in some ways, it's, it's it's very much the pivotal poem of the book. It's kind of like a uh, a manifesto for what happens throughout mm. the whole. Mm. Well, one of the things that um, you know you've already mentioned and that struck me about this poem was the the threads weaving through it and and through the book. You, it's not just environmental, human, animal. It's myth. It's reality, past, present, future, personal, and collective history, among other things. In that regard, can you say something about the line in this poem? And you already said something about it, but I'm going to ask you to say a bit more. Uh, the line, it being impossible to separate each thread and label them. Yeah, well, I have big problems with labelling. This is this is part of this going out into the bush and recording information. Is There's also something in recording information that's taking away from the place. And it bothers me. Now, that sounds so abstract. It's ludicrous. But there, there's actually more to it than that is that um, I have great problems with uh, the kind of, uh, with ecological collecting um, of specimens and um, and that kind of stuff. And I think that even in the abstracted form, when, and I do it as a poet, is that I have to be very kind of um, wary of why and what I'm doing, why I'm doing it and what I'm doing with it um, as I collate information. So that line's a reminder of that but also um it's not only that is that uh it's I, I constantly find a need in all my work to um to you know uh examine myself to uh you know rather than just being someone who's examining everything around me to really bother about who i am and i don't say that just because oh that ticks that box of um yes he's self-aware I don't, that's not what I'm meaning at all. Um, in fact, my son would say I was very not self-aware, but um, and that may be true. But the I want to be in my work. And um, the, the voice controlling a poem, which is necessarily usually the poets, or if you're collaborating a group of poets, 
um, has a very privileged position uh, the, 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 the reader and it's a responsibility. And I think if the voice is, um, even if it's by degrees of separation, is speaking with utter confidence, then the reader will be very doubtful uh, and they should be. And I don't have that. I have confidence in what I do and the purpose I do it with, but I don't have confidence in how well I do it. And I don't think anyone really does. Um, and if you don't, and, and I don't just mean formally, I mean, in terms of my whole kind of quotation marks project, what I'm trying to achieve. If we don't doubt ourselves constantly, um, then I don't know if we're really writing poetry. I think we're doing something else. And that's fine too. There's no problem with that. But I, um, so it's about an issue of doubt, self doubt, yeah, mm -hmm. self scrutiny. I get the sense that I could keep asking you questions and you could keep answering and we could go on forever. But I think we better get into the next poem. Okay, here we go. Of course, this is a poem that uh, obviously reflects, reflects my uh, pacifism. Um, you know, you're dealing with uh, ancient Greek myth, you're dealing with constant conflict and brutality and bloodletting and all the rest of it. Um, this is called Battle is Not Spec. Yes, that's right. Battle is Not Spectacle, it's a Catastrophe. And it's got a quote from the Argonautica book one. And, uh, you know, this is from an online version of the Argonautica and the citations uh, uh, listed in the front of uh, where the various things come from. But I'll read the quote. Uh, nor did anyone note with care that it was the same island. Nor in the night did the uh, Diolones clearly perceive that the heroes were returning. But they deemed that the Pelasgian warmen of the Macrians had landed. Therefore, they donned their armor and raised their hands against them. And with clashing of ashen spears and shields, they fell on each other like the swift rush of fire which falls on dry brushwood and rears its crest. And the din of battle, terrible and furious, fell upon the people of the Dolonians. Um Okay. Battle is not spectacle, it's a catastrophe. Blown back by the winds of our making, they clash with enemies conjured from darkness. Dawn will show bloody truisms, neighbor slaying neighbor, or people who might have been friends slaughtering under orders. On the beaches of their imaginations, the dead drift through the tyrant's dream, part smog, part oil, part bloody earth, and a strange intangible nature of torn flesh. War laps at the cold waters of the summer resorts. Weapons are made to be used. The dying are heard in and around the cities and people can only lament while still living, streaming away or sheltering in underground rail stations, masked against the pandemics. The clash, rigor mortis of empire craving and the media's feeding frenzy, networks embedding to bring more than images to screens. The frenzy around violence then regret the cascading losses and the news that no epic poet could contrive to embellish the story the invading army has taken Chernobyl. Concrete cradle of unbirth, monument of to spectres that fall across borders, call with impunity and reassurance, summoned from its eternal sleeplessness, full of self-praise as the reactor core maintains its rage. Now its makers have it back in their care. Sarcophagus, strategies of the exclusion zone. A tree shivers, a bird is dead before it can land, barely symbolic among seemingly familiar terrain, terrible, fell, furious. I noticed that I pluralized pandemics then. It's written in the book as pandemic, which really interests me because there's this kind of sense of repetition. Um, the, the, part, the, the bleak, it is a bleak thing, the repetition of violence and violence. And as we're seeing, you know, right now um, with Gaza, this the absolute um, horror of perpetuating and perpetual violence. And I suppose that's what the poem is really ultimately trying to deal with. Yeah, it's always going to be a topical subject, isn't it? Unfortunately. Um, Unfortunately. Now, um, just referencing the, the epigraph from the Argonautica, um, I was interested in the relationship between the epigraphs throughout the book and your poems. Were the poems a direct response to segments of the Argonautica, or did you write the poems and then find a correlation between them and extracts, extracts from the Argonautica? No, what happened was 
um, it happened in three different ways, the extracts. Um, there were poems that were written where I knew exactly what I wanted from the Argonautica that fitted it. But because it was um, composed in a quite structured way across a period of time, um, I tackled books of the Argonautica in specific ways. So I would, because uh, I've read them many, many, many times and, uh, and in different versions, um, I would uh, reread, say, um, book one, and then I'd isolate a series of quotes, which I then copy onto a, a Word document um, to keep. I write on manual typewriter mainly. In Germany, I'm not writing on one because I don't have one here, but back home at Jam Tree Gully, I have three of them. And um, I have always written on the manual typewriter. And so nearly all of this book, 90% was written on um, a manual typewriter. So I get the quotes, I put them in, extract them from the online version translation um, and now the copyright translation of course um, and paste them into a word doc and I have them uh, there they were the things I was concentrating on and then I'd be typing my poems which could you know happen at various places at various times on the manual typewriter or writing them by hand then on the manual typewriter and uh, then correlate them to the uh, quotes I got. So there's a consciousness of the quotes, of course, because I've extracted them, but there's also a kind of free forming in the poem because the poem would go where the poem went. Mm. Um, and sometimes it didn't fit with the quotes I got and I just put them aside. Sometimes I went back to them. Other times I wrote a poem and knew exactly where to go to get the quote I wanted in the work. Uh, so there were you know, a, a mixture of things, but because I did it in, a, it were two basic methods. One was the uh, sequential working through the um, Argonautic, the road of Apollonius's. But when it came to the um, interpolations from other versions of the Argonautica, of the Jason and the Argonauts, if you prefer, um, I they would happen more serendipitously. I'd be reading those versions and I'd say, ah, now I know what I want to write. It can go here in the middle of what's already existing. So there are a couple of um, structural kind of approaches. One was a, a sequential linear kind of process. And the other was more um, uh, occasional um, and more uh, interpolative and, um, you know, sort of seize the moment. That's where that can go. That That's what's missing there, a different angle. Yeah, so all those methods. I think with, you know, constructing books of poetry in general is that people rarely use one method. They use many and books kind of uh, gather and accrue and shape themselves in various ways. And it has to be said, because this is a cut down version, um, you know, uh, my conversations with um, Michael Brennan, the publisher, uh, in what was left out and what stayed in also obviously has a role because we cut quite a few pages. Um, and uh, I made the decisions uh, entirely. But, you know, um, it was in the context of Michael talking about cuts and so on. And that's part of it too. That's, you know, in any publishing process, there's always that going on as well. And that necessarily changes the book you had intended. In um, uh, With Jam Tree Gully, uh, um, you know, it came out over a decade ago, um, there was the version that was published. Um, there was a whole set of poems that didn't go in, that couldn't go in, they didn't fit, but they were really part of it and they were written as part of it. But in the second volume of my collected poems, I was able to put a section of poems, that, that the ones that didn't go in. And they're really relevant to me. And I think even relevant to the reading of the actual collection, but the collection I wouldn't mess with. I wouldn't then go through and add them and publish that. I published them as separate. And then I did the same with, thing with the silo in the first volume of my collected poems. The, the, that came out in 95. But John Forbes was the editor on that. And he um, insisted that half a dozen poems weren't included for various reasons, mainly to do with um, uh, kind of he thought that they, you know, the issues had already been covered or whatever. And he and I had slightly different views on these things. But I certainly always, um, you know, listened to John and what he said and followed what he said and did. But in the first one, I've added those poems at the end. Um, you know, they weren't included, but here they are. I couldn't resist it because um, I like them still and they mean something to me. But I think the book was better without as a book. Yeah. Uh, I'm glad they exist as poems. And in that context, very glad. But um, I think the decisions that are made in making books 
um, as you as you shape something for a readership are often quite good decisions, even if at the time they give you some, you know, oh, you had a few darlings. Yeah, exactly. And um, uh, you know, at, at the the pacifist version of killing your darlings is you're putting <laughs> in your clock bulbs. <laughs> Now, so the, the title of this poem commences, Battle is Not Spectacle. But but the poem then refers to the media's feeding, feeding frenzy and the network's embedding to bring more than images to screen. And war is often referred to as a theatre of war. So, I mean, it's certainly it is, is catastrophe, no doubt. But isn't battle spectacle too? Well, I suppose in the literal sense, and if we're talking about, well, the spectacle is the spectacle, yes. But what I'm trying to say, I'm thinking more along the um, situationist kind of uh, uh, Guy Debord kind of um, spectacle lines, uh, panegyric kind of stuff. I'm thinking more along the lines of spectacle as event, uh, spectacle as um, you know something that... Um, provides something to the viewer and uh even if it's a political event it's um you know it is being performed in some way i think that though those aspects are you know battle does do that i think that the um the, the presentation and the uh diluting down of spectacle as an idea political idea and the kind of reprocessing it into something infinitely digestible on you know, one of the things I find horrifying is, you know, in a battle zone, um, rather than communications being lost and the horror of people not being able to coordinate and look after themselves and so on, is that um, one of the great bothers is the news feeds are cut. Um, and, and the news feeds are sold as a version of witness. And if we take the news feeds away, then we won't see the truth. But quite that's not the reason networks sell this stuff. They either do it for money or they do it for national um, uh, kind of uh, projects. Uh, the BBC does it for for Britain. It doesn't do it for you know anyone else. It does it for Britain and the residues of the British Empire. Um, the uh, commercial networks, you know, you look at somewhere like CNN or something. They're entirely driven uh, by the market, and um, or. Bloomsburg, which is you know a financial kind of network, is entirely driven by the market. You know they might get the occasional little glimpses of justice and and fairness in there, but they are their primary drive is different. And that's what the poem is contesting, mm. is testing the fact that um, what asking the question why we're watching. If we're witnesses, we need to be a witness intending to bring change, not a witness just to absorb lots and lots and lots of horror, and um, then absorb more the next day of something else it has to be for a purpose so um yeah i you know maybe that spectacle on one level might prompt someone to act in a um, non-violent way but most often what it does is it just feeds a kind of sublimated violence to my mind i mean i might be entirely wrong but that's the logic behind my exploring that idea well it can often be incendiary kind of mm -hmm. very often mm -hmm. The uh, the locus of battle in this poem is both ancient Greece and Ukraine. Um, but is the poem really saying that the locus of every battle everywhere, and that in a sense it's all the same, like you know, neighbour slaying neighbour, friends killing friends on an endless repeating loop, a terrible, as you put it, familiar terrain, it just doesn't change. Is all war the same? No, not all war is not the same, but the consequences of war is always the same. Um, I'm a pacifist. I'm a very committed pacifist. It comes out of um, you know a lot of violence and disturbance in my early days, and um, seeing a lot of violence. And um, you know, in the in the world of drinking and addiction, um, you see things and you're part of things you you know which are truly reprehensible. And um, I've seen things around the world, and I I. Um, I have my commitment to pacifism is entire. It is probably the the very last thing in me that would ever go. And that is the belief that you you never hit back. You never strike back. Um, and you never respond to violence with violence. So in the end, that is, I do see all war in that context. So it is an absolutist view in that sense. But on the other hand, of course, within the um, context of wars themselves, 
there are many uh, versions uh, of war and they have uh, many different inflections. Of course, I can see that. I mean, I should say that my um, teenage years and childhood years were obsessively spent studying um, military history and um, I had intended to go to Duntroon. Mm. And when my politics took a very radical turn, very, very, very radical turn, that, of course, became ludicrous. And I became deeply opposed to all that. But when I was young, I mean, I was determined to be, you know, um, uh, an officer, not remotely interested in, um, you know, being on the battlefield, but in in controlling the battlefield kind of philosophy. That's a very, you know, the egomania of the young uh, person uh, who's absolutely saturated in military history um, and played strategy games and, you know, played war games and all that sort of stuff, board games and uh, uh, replication games and uh, replica games and all those things. I was right into all that stuff <laughs> until I had my kind of epiphany. Um, but the, um, so I come at it with a very specific kind of unfortunate knowledge of warfare yeah. and um, uh, awareness around its materiality. And, um, you know, I know that John Forbes love poem where he's, um, you know, watching on CNN, uh, watching uh, the Iraq war raging. And he's talking about the, um, the weapons being used, the uh, type of uh, fire taking place and all the rest of it. Um, it, it depersonalizes and he talks about it all being staged for someone else. It's, a, you know, it's what's love poem it's called. And there's a deep irony in it. But at the same time, there's a, um, John had a very obsessive fascination with military equipment and uh, such things. And um, I used to argue with him about it. I think it's an incredible poem, but I used to argue with him about it. And uh, I said, you know, I sort of shed those things a long time back. You're still clinging to them and, he would make various arguments about um, history and this and that and the other, which I won't bore you with at the moment. They're always interesting. He's a very interesting person, very smart person, but I disagree with him entirely. I think he was wrong. I think the fetishization of these things is perpetuation in many ways. That's not mentioning what they are. It's how you deploy them and what they do. But anyway, that's a whole other debate. So I think that um, in quick answer to your question, and after I've given you a long one, is that, um, yes, it is all... It's representative ultimately when it all comes down to it. It is people slaying people and there's people dying. Are there different wars and different uh, inflections in war? Yes. But is the end result ultimately the same? For those who die, it is. And for those who are injured, very likely. Yeah. And unfortunately, the epiphany you had is an epiphany many people never have. Well, they don't. And it's, it has shocked me all my life because, you know, uh, you know, I'm not particularly loaded up with epiphanies um, any more than anyone else. You know, I don't have this sort of, but it, I saw it and it was very visceral and I was so wrapped up in that stuff. I remember going around to this guy's house, um, who, a builder who was building something on uh, near where we were or where we were. And he invited me around because I had lots of um, uh, military ordnance stuff I'd collected, people had given me and I'd shown him. And he was a, he was a real gun nut. And he took me around to his place and he loaded, he would load his own ammunition and um, showed me all how to do it and all this sort of stuff. And he gave me a um, uh, 50 caliber Browning uh, machine gun um, bullet full, not just the shell, the whole lot it hadn't been fired, which I stuck on my bed head uh, next to the lump of blue asbestos that sat on my bed head. <laughs> and um, literally, and um, yeah, and I have horror horror memories of this i look back with horror abject horror you know my my mother deeply disapproved but because she had a very libertarian view to my knowledge searching and really facilitated what i wanted to do she let it go though she disagreed with it made that clear you know there was no doubt about that um she thought i'd work it out and indeed i did work it out and i remember just this looking at this stuff and thinking you know where am i going and um, yeah, so, but I, I do find it um, astonishing that people don't have an anti-violence epiphany. You know, I'm working on a critical book at the moment called Disarming, um, which is literally the philosophy, basic philosophy is disarming the world and how we can do it, how we can not, you know, just cut guns, but remove them entirely from the planet. 
Now, you know, is that the ultimate utopian dream or what? But, you know, I pragmatically and practically work my way through that, how we might do it. So anyway. Yeah. All right. Can we read another poem? Yeah. Oh, this is Baltic. Yeah, I um, went to Finland when I was um, 20. Um, I had very strange experiences there. So this harks back to that. Baltic. The return was a different Baltic for me. Not sailing over the rust of twilight, the harsh lingering winter outlines, I searched no silhouettes. The sun glared as night had been steely blue-black. Not sailing towards the Gulf of Finland, but away. Not sailing towards the Neva, a mouth of the White Sea Baltic Canal, with its first five-year plan brutality, those thousands of deaths from forced labour. I was mentally reciting Acme's poetry, and it resolved nothing within me. It didn't seem to be in translation, and I didn't know any Finnish poetry outside the Kal Kalevala at that stage of my unravelling. A journey was intended to be build, to build knowledge. Ordered to leave Helsinki by the secret police, I tried to remember trees, pines and oak, a few gnarled coastal bushes, and the grey water broken by the hull. I could only look over the side of the boat. I remember sitting fully clothed in a sauna. I suspect that made me suspicious. Or maybe it was attending the underground play in a language I couldn't understand, though I understood the gestures. Later, someone had been playing Hendrix and speaking of free love. There were bees preparing to head slightly north to meet the opening of flowers. The vessel was tall, but apparently not top heavy. The sea rose to meet it. You've mentioned, uh, you know, your thoughts on on quest. Um, I, I, like many others, um, have been seduced by the idea of journey and of quest, um, both physical and metaphorical. Um, and and I've always really thought of these things as as positives, uh, as as ways to build knowledge and experience, as ways to grow. Are these poems questioning that, uh, or linking journey and quest? to colonialism, acquisition, and similar human endeavours that have negative connotations for you? It is. I'm sorry. It is. Um, I also have been a quest obsessive amongst my many obsessions. I wrote a fantasy novel when I was in my late teens called The Staffs of Quan, which was, a, you know, I suppose a Tolkien-esque, um, Stephen Donaldson kind of <laughs> Thomas covenant -ish thing, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, called the staffs of Quan, and they went off to pursue the three staffs and the whole questing thing drew a massive map you know the sort of thing um <laughs> i i did that and um i really was you know i read um this is not a word of exaggeration i went i read lord of the rings 27 times um i mean seriously I, the more problematical thing is i count them you know it's <laughs> a real world. anyway so um yeah look i'm and obviously a lot of the myth I read and so on, they're all quest motifs. Yeah. But I think I think the and they're very attractive things, the quests, but I think they're very problematical as well. And I think they're too easily um rendered into a um into other narratives that dilute those other narratives down. So colonialism, obviously, um, but many other um sort of uh, of the grand narratives as well. And um I question it. I question what we're actually looking for and what we do when we get it. And of course, this quest is for the golden fleece and you undergo certain trials and tribulations and you you achieve your end and then you leave. And Medea goes with you and brings you heaps of problems. That's basically the kind of, you know, the motif that you're dealing with. Um, but that doesn't mean that it's not a complicated relationship with quest because it certainly is a complicated relationship. I'm still fascinated by it. I still read quest works i think i don't think you can avoid them if you're a reader um but i do question the whole motif of um the quest and what it's actually intending to do and whether in fact we um rather than pursuing goals and pursuing outcomes we shouldn't be sort of moving a little more laterally a little more sideways and actually um you know to use a corny pop psych thing, you know, find the goals within us, but I don't really mean that. What I mean is we should actually be looking to the fallout around us and trying to alleviate that. Uh, and maybe the quest is actually alleviation and stopping the damage rather than trying to 
have a um, utopian sense of where we're going. After having said some of the most utopian things you could ever hear anyone say, um, you know, there, there are lots of contradictions. One of the things that greatly interests me is ambiguity. I, in fact, the last my critical uh, trilogy on place uh, was called Beyond Ambiguity, um, Tracing Sites of Literary Activism. Um, so I'm really interested in um, ambiguity. I'm interested in paradox. I'm interested in, in contradiction, oxymorons, uh, and, and so on, uh, tautology, uh, and so on. I'm interested in these, these kind of ways language either um, doubles up on itself or contradicts itself or does something extra or unnecessary. Um, and in that you find lots of truths. And when it comes to quest, that's kind of where I sit. Yeah, I mean, you could say that all of your writing is a quest and, you know, there are different kinds of quests. Of and, you know, all of those things that you're talking about, the paradoxes and so on, they're all things yeah. we, hold, we hold within us, aren't they? Yeah, they are exactly right. And I mean, that's that's the truth of it. So one holds a position critically in, say, the work, but the, hopefully the poems are, are complicate themselves enough to show that it's not this sort of, um, you know, uh, irresolvable or um, uh, unchallengeable position because it is because you're challenging yourself constantly mm. yeah there are contradictions entirely in that position but those contradictions can be very generative and that's really what I keep trying to investigate to use that word mm. is that so yes I see problems in the quest but do I keep doing it will I keep writing these kind of works so you know I don't know <laughs> um this poem like like many others in the book um has a backward gaze on your younger self. Um, is it just observation of that younger self from your older self's perspective, or are you trying to reach into or address your younger self? Oh, I'm trying to address it. I have a lot of problems with my younger self. I mean, when I was young, I really, I was a full-blown enthusiast in every sense. And I did, I did everything, everything I could do. And I, um, you know, everything interested me. And I wanted to, uh, you know, I had a laboratory literally in the shed. I, I, I met lab balances and stuff like that. I worked in a lab um, from 15 to 20 uh, part time. And, um, you know, I investigated chemi, lumin, chemi and bioluminescence and did all these sort of things in quite serious way. Um, you know, programmed early computers and messed with a lot of tech. All the things I basically turned against later in very big way, dramatically so, you know, went and lived on a commune and grew veganic vegetables, you know, literally from one to the other, um, that kind of uh, shift. So I do look back to my younger self a lot because I try and understand it because in that younger self, I see many of the things that I see in others around me as older selves mm -hmm. that manifest either as very positive things and they do some really incredible things. Um, you know, many medi medical people I know and so on who you know, do much and sacrifice much of their own lives and time for the well-being of others, things like that. I see all that. But I also see a lot of the negative things that um, were accruing also going, you know, the military stuff, all that sort of stuff as well. And um, so I find that by looking at my younger self, I better, well, one better understands oneself, who one is now with all one's contradictions. But it's not only that, it's actually because it's quite a different person. Because there's such a definitive cutoff when, you know, there's there's vegan animal rights. Uh, well, we always loved animals. That's, I always did, though I didn't understand how to, I think. But there's that very distinct point in my life um, where I became a very different you know, person. And also when I um, got sober as well was another very important thing. You know, I lived this very, you know, but those around me were very damaged by who I was in my um, addiction years and the harm that I caused. Though it's nearly 30 years ago, I know some people would still feel and I acknowledge that. And so these are two very distinct cutoff points in my life. The becoming vegan animal rights activist and then becoming sober. And so when I look back, I'm looking back pre these times into quite a different kind of life, into different lives. So it's not only my childhood, it's also that young youth, young adulthood, and and, in, and also actually into quite mature adult life. So as I said, I didn't so rough until I was almost 32 and um, had been pretty well off my face since I was 15. So, um, you know, it's a long stretch. 
Um, but yeah, so that's why I do it to understand how different I think, and and I may be very wrong because in my younger self there may be nothing that is like anyone else, but I seem to think there is, and by looking at it I can better understand difference in people. And um, I, I see. I think the most important thing of all, David, is to cherish difference. I don't want any. You know, I don't think expect anyone to be remotely interested or like me in any way whatsoever. Um, but I am really interested in what other people are. I really am. I really like people. I really like difference. I even like people who are not very nice people. Uh, I find them. I find people interesting. I wish overall they didn't behave sometimes as they behaved, and I certainly wish collectively they didn't behave as they behaved yeah. most of the time. Yeah. But I think that you know, like no one's ever all good or all bad or any of that sort of binary crap. Oh, there's Thomas. Um, and the worst person in the world has got good in them. I just believe that. I, you know, I'm the person that thinks everyone, you know, the rehabilitation view of crime. Well, I have that. I don't believe anyone's ever, no matter how bad their crimes, are ever damnable. You know, to damn them to hell and all that sort of thing. I don't believe in any of that. I believe that all things are retrievable and all people are essentially good. So, you know, and if they aren't, they usually have something, you know, that's functionally biochemically gone wrong and they're not to be held accountable for that either. Yeah. You know, so, you know, I don't really see myself in any position to judge anyone, nor do I, but I do make statements about collective responsibility and behavior. Yeah. yeah. So throughout these poems, there are references to unmaking and unmapping and de-exploring and in this one, unraveling, um, deconstructing. What, what, where are you trying to go with these ideas? Well, because it's, it's like everything else. I don't think you can really understand anything until you see them in their component parts. So, you know, and also I really, really have a problem with the idea of the um, curatorial object of the of the thing that's so well made it goes on display as an example to all of what you can achieve i just don't believe that i believe that you know things can be messy things can be nice and polished too they can be messy and polished at the same time um so the unmaking of things is the unmaking of this idea of uh see i don't believe in aesthetics i don't believe in beauty i don't believe that any of those things exist i think they're just constructs and um, they are just constructs. I don't think, I know they are just constructs. And um, so I'm not interested in making this aesthetically pleasing object. Um, and so unmaking is unmaking of that. The deconstruction is very specifically Derridian deconstruction. It's not just the sort of, you know, the modern inflection in terms of, um, you, know, uh, you know, casual conversation. I actually mean looking at language, understanding how it works, you know, breaking it down in, in, a, in, a, in a very specific kind of way and exploring language in a very specific kind of way, looking at the consequences of language and so on. So I'm really interested in uh, how words are put together. Um, I don't think that the words that we use in these poems are necessarily, or that I use in these poems, or we use in any of our, say, English language poems, just to choose any language, are necessarily um, have do anything. They represent something. They represent a certain meaning. But I don't think they actually do anything their sounds that does something so in a sense there's for me probably more integrity in kurt schwitz's going oh yeah, 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 that kind of thing um in his uh, sonata than there is in um you know i went down the road because getting to the basic sound and gesture seems to me getting closer to something so words are just what i use really all i'm interested in the sounds and sights and senses um and they're things that the word hint towards or represent or suggest but they're not they're not you know they're not um essential categories or so on well and the other thing about it is that um with this unmaking and so on is that uh there isn't any end and if someone fully makes something it suggests that, that that's it now now we move on to the next thing. I just don't accept that. You're making a poem. It's going to be, if we write on the same subject, we're going to write differently. And that's a very beautiful thing. Um, and uh, you I don't believe you know, in beauty. I don't believe in beauty at all. And that's the irony. It's a very beautiful <laughs> thing. It is. And that is exactly right. I don't believe in beauty at all. Um, and yeah, that's that's just this kind of process of difference and ironies aside and jokes aside and quotation marks aside beautiful um yeah. is uh, that uh we we have to not to my mind close anyone's doors off 
Yeah. Well, see, in my eyes, this is a aesthetically beautiful book. I hope. I, I, I suppose, in your terms, I hope you find it so. <laughs> so there you go. There's a there's an answer. But I I don't I don't. I mean, you know, there's the extrinsic and there's the intrinsic, isn't there? And I suppose that um, you know, intrinsically speaking. I'm fine with that. Extrinsically, I have a problem with it. And that's so I'm delighted and pleased, which are aesthetic responses to my own uh, feedback on the aesthetic. But I don't actually believe in it. Uh, I believe in it in a sense of um, the exchange and the conversation, and genuinely so. I take the good spirit of it and I accept it and I think about it and I think, well, then that was done well. And that's fine. That is an aesthetic response. But I ultimately also know that it's it's probably in the grand scheme of things has no more truth to it than anything else. And I suppose it's this aesthetics declaring a kind of um, set of truths that bothers me more yeah. than the actual idea of beauty yeah. in itself. Okay, I get it. All right, would you like to uh, read another poem? Okay, so this is Argonautica, Less Than Heroes. <clears throat> Excuse me. Argonautica less than heroes. The paddocks are river plain too well known to let go the trees they held only a year before and more the year before that. And this so long after the big clearing, the paddock making, the staking out. Yes, the post story story is only made up of echoes insofar as we are capable of relaying. And now the downs are downs. Not a tree, but vast toxified greenness of hay rolling, of export corporatism, of fewer than, than no impediments other than the diminishing of the display case, the fra fracturing of the quest they watch unfold on a commodity futures market. We pass the spray rig up high on thin but tall wheels to lessen cross crop suppression lines through grass, and we search for event horizons which we imagine the driver is doing as well the curve cleared to the edge of sky. A pipit's relishing the field would close down under the mist of chemical, and the river below with its thin and dying riparian would not relish traces that will inevitably downhill into its catch-all. We, less than heroes. But the driver perched high at the helm in the crow's nest keeps those old trade routes open. A voyage of commerce, they'll tell us, is feeding the world. For our viewers and listeners, uh, I'll mention that John asked me to select some poems from this book, and I selected far too many. And John chose eight and said, well, there could be a ninth. And uh, I chose this one as the ninth. And, and there were a couple of reasons why I did that, John. I, I wanted you to read this poem um, because um, there are references throughout the book to heroics, heroism and heroes. And it is usually a questioning, uh, as, as much of the book is about many things. Um, what are you trying to say generally and in this poem with its references to less than heroes about the idea or mythology or connotations of the heroic? Well, first of all, the basic kind of um, metaphor running through the, and, and it's a symbol as well, running through the poem is the idea of the um, farmer as being the, the hero who feeds us. And in the case of this one, it's a farmer sitting on their um, spray rig uh, spraying you know deadly chemicals across the fields which will feed us all and the, the toxicology of uh, how it affects the surroundings and all the rest of it so so it's a it's a very ironized hero but one nonetheless who's acknowledged and recognized um by many and certainly within the discourse by themselves as being um heroic so you know the less than heroes is is the damage we do in being heroic um, on a literal level, um, the broader question of the hero, you know, it's one I can test all through the book, is that any, um, and it's a funny thing for an author, because the author is immediately fetishized as something separate from the reader. And um, though they may not be um, a hero to the reader, they're playing the, the hero role of um, directing events or directing the conversation around events. The hero gets to dominate. Who we hear from the um, um, uh, Iliad, we hear about Achilles. And, you know, Achilles gets bumped off relatively early in the war, of course, but the book is really about Achilles in many ways. And um, it, it's it's about the hero and it's, and the hero, the hero dying and the uh, kind of, uh, and how, 
time will remember forever that, that immortality is in fact a story. Now, I don't believe that, of course. And I think that, um, you know, the false hero position of the author is one we need to contest because, and that's why I'm so interested in collaboration, is it breaks down this kind of authorial um, uh, uh, authority. And um, so in questioning, the less than heroes actually also refers to, to poets, to writers, to people making witness of what the farm is doing, the hero producing the food to feed us all. Um, if we didn't see the farmer doing that, we'd just get our grain on the table and make our bread and be happy. But someone has told us he's put toxic stuff all over the grain and all around the surrounding environment's been affected and so on. The river system's damaged by it and so on. And we think differently about that uh, hero. It's a less than hero. So that's mm. the basic principle. Yeah. Mm. And there's another strain of things that goes throughout the book um, and and in this poem as well, and that's of echoes. Um, and is that tied into uh, your sort of... Uh, thinking about time, past, present, and future, and the idea that history repeats, that, that we repeat our mistakes, that all of this reverberates throughout time? Yes, it is. And that's you know, a pretty good summation of it. Um, it is a constant motif in my work. It has been since the earliest publications. Um, so you know, for the last 42 or 43 years, 44 years now, um, is that, uh, yeah, echo is a word that comes again and again. And it's uh, echoes are things I, both deeply interest me and attract me and deeply bother me. They kind of, uh, they're uncanny and they they freak me out a bit, but I always try and make echoes and listen for echoes. And I can be quite annoying if people are walking with me. My son's walking with me and I make a loud noise to see if I can get an echo or something like that. It can be quite frustrating, I suppose. But I am interested in them. and um, But they are exactly what you say. And, uh, you know, I've written works on art collected under the title Echoes, because we're also constantly echoing other creativity, other words. As poets, we're echoing everyone else. You know, this is the thing about the, there's, there's, there's no um, individuality in writing. We are part of a big sharing of language, and uh, we echo other people constantly. If we've ever read, we echo. And even if we haven't read, we echo the, um, the kind of environment around us. So that is a kind of uh, recognition that, um, you know, that we are we are many others as we write as well. We're all living in a big echo chamber. We are. Yeah. Um, now some of the things that you've said, um, particularly your notions about how poetry can change things, um, suggest to me that in many fundamental ways, you're, you're an optimist. Um, yeah. But this poem suggests a kind of fatalistic position that we are doomed to never get past our own echoes that, that we are trapped within them. Well, you know, this is the the contradiction, the ambiguity. This is the this whole thing. I mean, that sounds like an escape clause, doesn't it? But it's actually not, because I'm really interested in these things in themselves. I don't just try and evade them. I, I really try to investigate them and write a few trillion poems about it uh, <laughs> in the investigation. But um, I am an optimist. I, I do believe we can always turn things around. You know, the definition of uh, collapse and bad and all these things um, is inadequate because when you're in them, are you saying, well, we shouldn't exist anymore? No, no one, very few, some people do, but very few people do say that. They say, what can we do now? It's so bad. Um, it will get worse. And I'm always the person that says, well, let's not let it get worse. Let's stop it now. And then when it's worse, I say, let's not get it worse. And, and I do, that is the way I operate, but I also um, strongly um, recognise the absolute nature of the catastrophe and the nature of um, collapse. And um, I also think part of that optimism is the ability to acknowledge process and work with it to try and improve things. So um, nothing in existence has um, is without purpose. Um, you know, I don't want any death in the world, but people who have lost their lives haven't gone, to my mind, pointlessly. Um, that their their non life is very much uh, an echo that the living feel and the living can grow through. So um, you know, it's this um, nothing matter can't be created um, nor destroyed philosophy, I guess, 
that um, you know that there is a there is a purpose in in being, and there's also a purpose in unbeing. Um, you know, I'm I suppose ultimately a pantheist, really. Mm. Well, I'm interested in uh, all the sort of contradictions that you're sort of outlining for us. Um, the, one of them is the in the trope of environmental degradation that runs through the book, um, because here you link it to our rationalizations or justifications for what we do. For example, you know, we have to do this to feed the world. Um, so, so there are conflicting imperatives at work always. And I'm just wondering, is the nub of the problem our inability to reconcile these imperatives? Well, you see, I think, for example, with the, the cropping one's a good example because, you know, I'm an advocate of uh, organic farming, of, of using uh, less land, of you know, not running uh, cattle and things on them that, uh, you know, produce huge amounts of methane and occupy huge amounts of space and so on and so on and all those kind of things and of uh, net allowing herds to naturally um, diminish, not force them into diminishing, but to gradually over time, uh, not to force the creation of herds, that kind of thing, let things resort to a more, um, to, to their own equilibrium. But um, so uh, I, I actually see alternatives constantly. I think it's not just a matter of saying, you know, this is wrong. It's just saying, well, I'd say in response to that, if I was addressing, um, which I do sometimes, you know, a group of people about farming issues or whatever, I talk about how we could organic crop um, and how you can and how you can, you know, use different kinds of uh, regimes. You can replant trees. You can make, uh, you know, watersheds that aren't, aren't going to destroy the land, all these kind of things. There, there are a whole series of pragmatic um, answers to all these. And in my activist life, they are, well, I do. I don't just say, no, no, no. I say, no, how about this? No, how about this? And, um, and I think the poems are trying to do the same. And that's where the contradiction seems to come in. That's why I say they're reconcilable contradictions for me, because I want to present the contradiction. But that's not to say it's just going to stay a contradiction, because mm. I think it can actually change. Cool. Would you like to read another poem? Uh, limestone at Ocean Beach, uh, Quarrabup. So that's um, what the colonists call Denmark in the southwest of Western Australia, the town of Denmark around there. Um, its Noongar name is Quarabup. Uh, and there's a thanks at the back acknowledgement to Andy Carroll, <clears throat> excuse me, who's mentioned in the poem, who I sent the poem to and got here to okay it um, in terms of writing about that country. I go through these processes. I think they're very important. Limestone at Ocean Beach, Quarabup. I'm breathing out of my usual pattern, walking the beach under limestone cliffs. This is because I am thinking over Auntie Carol's words of welcome, breathing in the DNA of her ancestors, breathing the breath of millennia, breathing in the forest meeting, low scrub, coast scrub and marshlands, the beach. There's a strong breeze coming off the ocean and the bark stained waters of the inlet are dialoguing with a pulse of deep water narrowing to channel. This air that has travelled back and forth with such energy, such vigour that it absorbs extra photons and is so lively it fills lungs with light. It is hard to breathe if you don't know how. And to adjust is to bring crow and seagull into alignment, for pelican to carry sea upriver in lung of beak, for limestone to be made and unmade by water and air. So this poem, like, like others in the book, is a poem of place. Uh, what is the significance for you of Ocean Beach uh, on the southwestern coast of Australia? Well, interestingly, um, as a kid, um, we often went down, as you do, you go down south um, in that era, especially for holidays. So I holidayed down there quite a bit. Um, so that's its original significance. The second significance is when that poem was written, Tracy Ryan, my partner, was um, do, uh, attending a, a writers' festival down there. And... Um, and I came along, I think we did a reading together as well. Yes, we did. And, um, but basically I was there to listen, which is great. And, um, I did a lot of walking as I always do. I was with my son on the beach that day, long Quarraba, and I was, you know, processing what it is to visit a place over a long period of time, every now and again, and the politics and ethics of that. And, uh, so on, it's a very beautiful place. Uh, it truly is, um, you know, and you got below you the great southern ocean and the antarctic is down there and that kind of thing um across the way 
And I was just processing the immenseness and also the very particularity and up closeness of a place and thinking that um, how much things change and don't change. So, you know, really it was that kind of uh, questioning as most of my place poems are. I mean, most of the poems in here are written about places I go to frequently. They're around me, but mm. other places are places I visit or have visited across my life. Um, haven't been to for many years or whatever. Um, so, so that's the kind of um, the thinking around that. And, and also the whole, I had heard Artie Carroll speak and she was saying that you're in you know, a place of her family and her ancestors and so on. And as you breathe, you're breathing them in and they're part of you. I thought it was a very generous thing to say. And, you know, Noongar um, elders um, uh, are often just so incredibly generous um, with um, colonials. And, um, it, it, you know, it's just such an unjust uh, thing on every level and that generosity I, I wanted to reflect in the poem and as I said I was consulted her and got permission to do so um, and now I don't think I can give anything back because I can't I've got nothing other to give than my good faith and my belief that only Carol's country should be restored to her and the rights over it and uh, people living on it should negotiate and interact with her um, and that dialogue should be there and not with me or other people but um i suppose it's a it's just um the brilliance to me of sharing a place um even if i probably shouldn't be there uh it's the brilliance of just interacting with a place and having that generosity to think about can you say something about how you came to know auntie carol well i only met auntie carol because of that event she gave the opening talk and i got talking with her and she gave the welcome to country yeah. and she and the talk as well and um the uh and that so that was specific to that um time uh my um the elders and so on i have worked with and uh no longer term and who i know as friends uh that's a completely different dynamic you know they're long-term dialogues um this was hearing someone be very generous and feeling that uh she um, need not have been really because, you know, given given what has happened to her country, but mm. she was, and um, but she wanted people to understand where they were and what they were doing. And I, I just, uh, yeah, so that's what I was thinking of when I was on the beach. Mm. And then I wrote to her and asked if, and showed her the poem and we worked that out. And um, yeah, so she gave permission to use it in the way I've used it. But uh, no, so that that was a, a, you know, a meeting on the occasion mm. situation, yeah. What do you mean um, by your first line, I'm breathing out of my usual pattern, and by the line later in the poem, it is hard to breathe if you don't know how? Well, out of my usual pattern because uh, it's not where I live, even though I'd been there a number of times across my life, it's not where I live, so that's out of my usual pattern. Also out of my usual pattern because I live inland, and that's the sea. Though I've lived by the sea at various times in my life for years on end, but I primarily have lived inland. Uh, I write about the sea a lot because of years of living by it, but I inland to that. And the other thing is the um, the whole, uh, the, the last image is literally one of um, you know, being on stolen country, of, mm. um, of breathing in both the immensity and uh, wonder and complexity of a culture, but also obviously um, being part of the cause of the um, dislocations within that uh, space uh, between people and their country, and also um, of being an ongoing part of that um, with the best will in the world. So it's a, it's a complex relationship with place. I mean, all the poems have complex relationships with place. When I'm at home at quotation marks jam tree gully um it's still the same complex relationship and it's still a constant negotiation and i still run things constantly by um you know elders and so on about um uh where i live and and, and marion um kick it um Nunga, Baladon Nunga, older she and i have been working together over the last couple of years 
and uh, immensely generous when it comes to my consulting and asking and so on. Because, of course, that's an intrusion as well. Constantly asking and so on is really, um, you know, it's a big ask. Yeah. People don't have to respond and they don't have to. And and she's immensely generous that way. And uh, I'm grateful. But I also know it's an imposition as well. And it's something you know, I have to think about. I've always loved the notion that with every breath, you know, we breathe in the past, uh, the breath of millennia, as you put it, um, that the that the air is charged with human and animal and environmental history, that every breath puts us in deep connection with all these aspects of planet Earth. Mm -hmm. Do you think this poem um, links many of the threads in your theme and throughout the book? Yeah, I think it does. I think that I think that's fair enough. Um, I write a lot about breathing. And also, you've got to remember, this was written during... Um, you know the the height of COVID, and um, you know it hasn't gone away, but the height of it, yeah. Um, and so breath is something you're always conscious of in super vivid depastralism. The book before this, breath is one of the dominant kinds of you know uh, undercurrents, even when it's not mentioned, it's mm. kind of there. Um, so yes, I do think that. Of course, the um, the, the for millennia was um, Annie Carroll's uh, point, but it's a shared point, and also. I think the other message behind it is that we also share responsibility for the entire biosphere. Um, you know, we're, you're breathing in my ancestors, as she points out, but we're also breathing in the breath of, of the planet as well. And we have a responsibility towards that breath. I really believe that too. So um, yeah, no, I, I think that's a fair enough statement. Yeah. My sense um, of this poem is that it is imbued with, with wonder and joy and a, and a sense of harmony at how everything is interconnected. Do I have that right? Yeah, I think so. Um, you know, there's always, with everything I ever write, there's always the self-questioning and doubt. But yes, there is. But, you know, the thing is that, um, you know, I love nature. Uh, I love the world. I you know, I love people. Um, I may be a very strange person, but I do. I do. And um, I'm actually, you know, I'm a really positive person, ultimately. I can get... You know, very down and destroyed by what goes on in the world and so on. And I do, and I act as much as I can. But I actually, as I said, I believe in this inherent goodness. Now I know people who have suffered horrendously at the hands of ungood people. Mm. Who, you know, that's a pretty big thing to say. But I do. I don't believe it. It has to be that way, and I don't believe it had to be that way. And I believe that you know we we learn so it's not like that again. And that um, so that positiveness um yeah it is there you know i often people often remark on my work of how you know grim i am and how uh you know it depicts you know the violence of the world and all those things what well, it does but um in showing things uh and analyzing things and discovering things is um part of the process of trying to emerge from them too so mm. Mm. okay you got time for another one yeah the Golden Fleece, Rare Metals. The greenwash of the new mining has no shame, buying into local community, supporting young and old, inculcating itself into the ag show as if it's been along for the ride, the ride of dispossession. The future is green as the sample, as the sample, the forest without disturbing the ground, as if the ultrasound of the land will give birth to a new forest. They are busy on their phones, scrying the battery loads of existence, Largesse is the quest and wealth is the bounty to make happy families all over the region. Buying up farms, setting up in colonial homesteadery, extensions of the first land grants, absentee owners. A sporting chance of success is on the victory parade as too many locals sign away what's not theirs to sign away. Some resist. Some see the smile as a lie. Some know the green metal revolution is a violent and bloody revolution that only serves its instigators. Marry trees, bleed red sap, then the same is gone. Birds can always move on to the next tree, the next mast, and the next. So, uh, I mean, the title, The Golden Fleece, you're clearly referencing um, the, Jason and the Argonauts, The Golden Fleece there. Um, can you speak a little bit about the correlation between this poem and, and The Golden Fleece and Jason and the Argonauts? Yeah, well, of course, the golden fleece in the book takes on two forms. One is the golden fleece of mining, 
and uh, you know all the horror that's caused um, on the way to getting there, and then all the horror that's caused on the way of taking it back, and so on. So it's it's just a straightforward um, kind of parallel there, um, or correlation. The other one, of course, is that um, is it refers uh, it was actually three. It specifically refers to um, this long term struggle I've had with this mining company near where we live. And it's having an eye on the 28,000 hectare forest called Julamar Conservation Park, which is in their exploration range. They're saying at the moment they're not going there, but they've been drilling in it. And that was contested and all the rest of it and so on. So it's all tied up with that. So their golden fleece, of course, are these um, uh, metals and elements, platinum group elements that uh, go into making um, electric cars and such things. Um, so that's that reference. The other thing is there's an irony in it too. The golden fleece also refers to the um, sheep farming and uh, seeing the trucks, the sheep crammed in them, you know, as you do uh, if you live in the country constantly and uh, being taken down to the um, slaughterhouses and and live export as well, mainly the slaughterhouses. Um, and yeah, um, and then the not so golden fleece by which time they've all shat on each other and they're all, you know, ruffled and all the rest of it. So there's that in there as well. And then there's the um, the, the idea of the uh, the writer seeking this kind of uh, mythical uh, work that does something incredible and changes things, which is you know, fallacious and absurd. Um, these things shift and they are what they are and they're neither good nor bad and all that sort of stuff. But um, it's an allusion to that as well. To that kind of search you know why do we write what purpose are we writing for uh in this case it's for an activist purpose and that becomes its own golden fleece as well which is an irony of course from a vegan perspective um yeah. and it's playing with that as well so uh, the irony of language as much yeah. as anything else all those things we're working on lots of levels yeah um, so this poem depicts mining companies as shamelessly saying one thing and doing another well yep. you know, we've, we've heard that before as yep. is as immoral, unprincipled, unscrupulous, deceptive yep. in pursuit of self-interest. Yep. Whereas you put it, um, largesse is the quest and wealth is the bounty. But isn't that a reflection of humanity as a whole? Um, Very likely. And mining companies embody humanity as a whole. You know, they don't embody many of the good principles of humanity. They embody all the bad ones. That's for sure. No, I'm. I. I'm. I had a lot of contact with the mining industry when I was young, when I started working in that laboratory at 15 for the mineral sands industry. And I saw it up close, really up close. My father, when I was very young and my, before my mother and father divorced, went off to work on the mines and stayed there all his life pretty well. And um, my um, great-grandfather was um, the uh, foreman of the South Champion Mine in Kukaini in the West Australian gold fields. And so on it goes. It's never been far from me. Um, and uh, I, I have seen the worst wrongs done by mining companies, and they are unscrupulous. They lie, they deceive, and they destroy. And, um, you know, this, I'm afraid, is the reality I've witnessed. And for all the dressing you can go around them, the jobs and all these other things, I know, I know, I've been part of my family stuff too, is that in the end, it's still doing that. Now, you can talk your way around these things and say, well, it's necessary because da, 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 point to the computer we're speaking on and all those kinds of things and say it's hypocritical to say otherwise. But unless one challenges these companies, they just get more and more and more and more. And my challenging these companies isn't going to stop people having their, their items they need or want, um, but it might, it might stop some of the environment being further desecrated and destroyed. Uh, it might stop, um, you know, more carbon going into the atmosphere, and so on and so on. So, you know, this is this is a this is a life struggle with mining companies. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about what you're referring to in lines like the ride of dispossession and too many locals sign away what's not theirs to sign away? Yeah, well, you know, people selling their farms to mining companies, who then mine them uh, and dig up the country and devastated even more than the farms did, um, they don't have that right to do that. That's, um, in, you know, Indigenous country. And, the, you know, there's no consultation in any of this. It just happens. And, um, yeah, that's what that's directly, directly referring to, the right of dispossession. 
this is what we all sit on. You know, um, uh, I, David Lynch, the filmmaker, has this wonderful expression when he disappears. He says he's on the work train. He's on the fun work train. That's what he says. I'm on the fun work train. And I do think that um, people, you know, even if they've even if they've got the kind of politics that recognise um, the theft of land, there's, they're all on the um, the fun dispossession train. Now, David Lynch wouldn't think that at all. I'm not for a moment suggesting. I'm just using the kind of speech pattern. But um, uh, quite the opposite, I'd say. But um, I think that people think that they can just go along and, you know, that farm's been sold. We didn't really have to do anything about that. You know, it's not our problem anymore. And it is just, I call it the um, the dispossession train. We're all on the dispossession train, even when we're pretending not to be. And that's a problem. Mm. Um, you end the poem, uh, I, I thought, interestingly, with a, with a question mark, you know. Birds can always move on to the next tree, the next mast, and the next question. Is the inference in the question that if we keep going on the path we're going on, one day there'll be no more trees or masts or... Correct. No more birds be, in the bottom of them. None. There'll be none. There'll be no more trees for the birds to land on, and there'll be no more birds. I'm afraid so. And uh, do I think that has to be the case? No. And will until the last tree and the last bird's there, will I still keep trying? Yes, and so will many, many others. But um, I'm afraid that is what's being said, yes. Okay. Got time for another one? Yep, we'll do one more, I reckon. And then uh, let's have a look here. Uh, we are, How many? We are one, maybe I can... Quickly squeeze in two more if you want. I want. Okay. Oh, dusk at midday. This is a, I, I like this poem um, uh, quite a lot for all sorts of reasons, even though it's a very sad poem, as my poems often are. But um, dusk at midday. I write about dusk in the late morning in the hours before storms. I am not relying on forecasts. It is written on my skin. The house ticks more rapidly in its tension of expansion and contraction as weather builds. The house questions its standing. It's a necessary debate, and we are inside it, waiting expectant. This is the air becoming a sea, a metamorphosis, but not to state the obvious. Thickening cloud out of nowhere, occluding sun. The long, brutal dry will end under brutal conditions. Suddenly the day will seem as dusk, and it won't be prophetic. But if it doesn't rain... Lightning will set up, will set the district alight. This has been the pattern. And though dusk is my preferred time of day, there's nothing refreshing, refreshing or ambiguous about it. The tragedy is as clear as day and fires are harder to fight at night if the conditions don't ease, if the wind doesn't drop. The magpies are out of sorts, uneasy in their roles as seabirds. So obviously this is a very bleak and sad, devastated poem. The reason I like it is because I remember exactly the moment, this the, the smoke darkened sky and all the rest of it, and I feel very viscerally there, and it carries all those kind of responsibilities of the moment. So that's what I mean by like quotation marks. Yeah, is this Jam Tree Gully or where it's yes, yes, yeah. yes, it's home. And do you think this is a poem that couldn't have been written, say, twenty or even twenty years ago, because the conditions for it were not yet so manifest? Well, I think it could be written, but they were less likely to have been written because what has become very clear over the decades is that um, you know the, the fire events are more and more frequent. Um, there always have been fire events, and that's part of the ecology of the place. You know, certain things germinate and all the rest of it. The fire has always been part of, but this is frequently, and every year um, when there we're on absolute uh, you know alert all the time. And dry lightning storms are, are really frightening things. Um, and the fires are constant. And they go, you know, most of the year, except for a few months now. Whereas before, you'd have a few months of fire season when you have to worry. But now you have to worry a lot of the year. And uh, so things have very definitively changed. And my poetry is a record of this. I think that's probably what my poetry mainly is, sadly, is because I've been doing it since I was so young and recording natural uh, making natural observations of nature is it's a record of climate change, human-induced climate change. It is very, very, very rapid. And uh, it's all there in the text. Mm. Well, how long have you been at Jam Tree Gully? In Jam Tree Gully, we've been there, I think, 14 years. And before that, um, we lived in York, um, uh, which is where my family lived. Um, and that's in the Avon Valley as well. 
Um, we, of course, over the years have lived also for, uh, or when I was young, I lived in the Southwest on farms and so on down there. Um, when we lived in Cambridge for many years uh, and in America for many years, when we lived in America, um, we still were based in uh, York. Um, so really what we're talking about is a kind of uh, presence in the, what they call the Avon Valley, uh, Wheat Belt, Avon Valley, so of the region. So in Jamtree Gully, I mean, let me think, 2008, so 15 years almost, so, uh, Jamtree Gully. So this dramatic change you've seen in 15 years? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the dramatic change I'm referring to is actually across my life since, you know, I first went up to Wheatlands Farm, my auntie and uncle's farm, uh outside of york about 18 k's outside of york um when i was zero you know a few days after birth so yeah. it's a whole life of association with the region the change is far more rapid across my life i'm talking about recording it um i've recorded it in that region but uh in the last 15 years in um near where we are which is uh down through gully on near where Yuid and wajak country meet belladong noongar country we're on belladong noongar country um, north of the town of Two J, um, northeast of the town of Two J. Mm. Mm. Since um, I, I felt the sense of foreboding in this poem, not 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 altogether apocalyptic, but but tending towards it, I thought it's, it's palpable. Um, do you think it helps to reduce the impact of climate change to focus on observations of the local as you do in this poem? poem? Because otherwise, it's just too big for us to grasp. Well, I think that's what international regionalism is all about, concentrating on the local to understand the larger context. We can understand most things locally and when it comes to environment. What we do to the environment locally is going to be, you know, and even if it's an urban environment, you know, you can, <laughs> there are degrees within urban environments. There's the, you know, the concrete jungle and there's the um, efforts to cool it down with trees and all the rest of it and all those kinds of things, to, you know, to stop the heat sinks and so on. Um, I think we observe what's happening to the world immediately around us and we have a responsibility to the local. In many ways, that's the only way we can ultimately bring change um, is to really concentrate on what we do and how we live um, and then you know, hopefully broader communities take that on. But um, yeah, and what you can hear now actually is across the valley is the um, university hospital about six k's away and the helicopters come in sadly with accident victims and land on top of the hospital. So you can probably hear that in the background. So I'm giving you a little bit, bit of a description of where I am at the moment. Yeah, but um, it, is a, it is an apocalyptic poem. As I said, the reason I like it as a poem is because I actually, it really, for me, captures exactly that moment. And they're terrible, terrifying moments. Mm. Um, many a time have I written poems of looking out and watching uh, smoke or fire approaching and so on, having to evacuate. We had to evacuate um, at that period. Um, and uh, yeah, it's quite terrifying. Mm. Mm. Um, you say at the start of the poem, I'm not relying on forecasts, it is written on my skin. Um, do you mean that, you know, your body senses the storm coming, that, that, that the, the body is sensitive to the changes around us? Yes, the body is a barometer. That's a constant image of my work. I read it, as it said in the, um, I think it was um, uh, in the Korobat poem, you know, I read it through my skin uh, and in other poems as well, earlier poems, you know, I, I read, you read things through. I, I'm very much interested in not privileging any of the senses because I don't think if people don't have certain senses, they're any more, any less sensitized than anyone else. You yeah. know, even if I were unable to see or hear, I would still consider myself highly sensitized to the world, and I'm sure I would be through you know, my skin and, and, and other senses, or a sense of just being and so on. So I'm very uh, concerned about not privileging any of the senses, though I work a lot with visual and sound um, kind of components. So I often refer to the body as a whole being the thing that's receiving something rather than specific senses, though I do that as well. Yeah. Um, has the behaviour of birds noticeably changed in the last 15 yes. years? Yes, in fact, I've got a poem called The Behaviour of Birds so in another place. But yeah, no, it has. Uh, everything's changed. Everything has changed. Everything is changing. There's no doubt about it. And you watch processes of uh, quotation marks, adaptation taking place and you know, animals trying to deal with things and so on. Um, but yes, it has. 
So you can truly discern, you can truly discern that the magpies are out of sorts. Yeah, you can clearly discern and many, many other things too. I there's as I said, I keep records of all these things in my poems, but also my journals. You know, I kept journals for you know all my adult life and uh they document pretty well everything, you know, temperature and uh wind and um, animal sightings, bird sighting, everything um changes, um behavioral shifts. So that they're a kind of record. Okay. Another poem. Yep. Um, I'm going to read Argonautica Sheep and I will finish with Medea and the Clouds. So is that all right with you if I read yeah, those two? Yeah, please do. Argonautica Sheep. Rich in sheep and many other flocks and sacrifices bleating as herded, so many sheep almost beyond counting till the counter clicks over, each offering to the trireme or the telly, which is the best hope for sheep, though some are bred and modified, the drop wool in clots to walk on their legs, the lamb, countless, sacrificial countless, and foregathered to retain the warmth, bare-skinned in sharp southerlies or heavy with wool in searing easterlies, Pick and choose the choice, simile and metaphor, walking figurative over the hills, reducing undergrowth as prospectors make free. In the bare earth spaces, the plains are slaughter unnumbered, multitudinous beyond count, offering riches, cutting throat, offering entrails, each wheel spinning to weave the weekend market to meet the up from the city demand, the sample of primary industry, boutiqueish fibres, while Circe in bloody halls is blamed, a swirl of flame, sea and hinterland air. That's one for the sheep. And finally, Medea and the clouds. Medea is a big figure in this work. And rather than being the, uh, the queen of evil and all hell of the future, she has a far more um, restorative and... Uh, I think, hopefully, filled out personality kind of role in this work. Madeira and the Clouds. The moon is between Madeira and the clouds. She will leave the moon and travel with the clouds like obsession. That adventure capitalist having promised her more than he will ever give. The hedge fund financing of a visionary art project without scrutiny, without an examination of self. She has heard of poets accepting laurels from an arms manufacturer because it only makes the vehicles that carry the weapons rather than make the weapons themselves. She is used to this kind of reasoning. The moon too close, almost in the palm of her hand, a blood flare to reveal the living to the dead, meaning the wall will not pass them by, though the clouds continue on out of their reach. Those clouds, which will fade and reappear high above masts and trees, beyond the moon. The moon is between Medea and the clouds. She will leave the moon, and travel with the clouds. Now, I, I had a bunch of questions for each of those poems, but I thought rather than ask them, I'd ask you if you wanted to sort of say something about each of those poems. Well, the first one, of course, is a, you know, it's a sad paean to sheep and their fate uh, in the, um, you know, the agricultural kind of realm of Australia and anywhere. The triremes, of course, are the, um, the three-tiered uh, ships we see um sailing of course and that's a in terms of the um um argonautica that's a anachronism anyway because they were you know, the argonaut would have been a single um row row of rows uh oars um on a singing keel um there's another story in there it's also talking about the huge separation between perceptions of what the country is between the city and the, uh, the country. Now that's an old chestnut and an annoying one too, the city in the bush crap that you know Australian poetry has thrived on and uh, which I mock mercilessly. But there's a kind of true um, aspect to it, a truism to it as well. And that is um, that, uh, you know, it's very easy to get separated off from the means of production, from the, um, uh, you know, the actual source of food um, that people you know, utilize and so on. And it's so distant from them, they don't feel the pain of it or the consequences of it. So that poem's alluding to, that, and many other things. It's really a kind of uh, um, a description of uh, the different roles sheep play in um, a community that's aware and also unaware. Mm. Okay. Oh, and the other poem, well, that's a different thing altogether. That's, that's a poem about, um, so that's a complex one because. 
Medea is, as I said, a, um, a re sort of retrieved character in this Argonautica. She's um, a lens through which the hypocrisies of all the men around her can be seen. And there are plenty of those hypocrisies. And um, the whole role that, is that, that she's allowed to play within the epic industry. There's another thing about the epic, the industry of epics. <laughs> Um, and the uh, artistic production around that industry of epics is, you know, a certain fetishized role. And so I put that in the, sort of the consumer capitalist context, the adventure capitalist kind of exploitation, the uh, the way the arts are, uh, are sold to the highest bidder, the way we receive the uh, rewards, if we're lucky enough, of the um, uh, arts world and not wanting to terribly scrutinize where the money comes from or what it actually is when we should be that kind of thing is questioned in it and it's a mere corporate as well because i've benefited over my life from uh, such rewards and um, some of them i've refused others i've accepted um and you know none from, ar a, so none from arms manufacturers though None from arms manufacturers, absolutely not. In fact, I refuse to have my books submitted to certain prizes for those sort of reasons. And I would refuse anything that was awarded for me and anyone associated with any toxic industries or those kind of things without any question and have done in the past, yeah. um, or at least refused shortlistings and so on in that context of you know global capital and so on. But, you know, all sorts, you know, I think it's important to understand where where the money comes from. And what it is, um, you know, probably in Australia, the best people probably get is the uh, kind of the government tax funded um, grant system, that kind of thing, simply because it's uh, it's the people providing the money in a sense. Though if we start looking deeply, it's also many other things providing the money as well, which are probably more problematical. Uh, so there are modes of interpretation in that, but, you know, people have to make a living. So it's not a judgmental thing. And I've benefited from it as well but i think that uh as hypocritical and vile as governments are uh probably you know taking money off people and redistributing it it's better redistributed that way than to um you know the military or to uh any of the toxic industries that government and enterprises government supports so there are all these things sort of sublimated in that poem it's a poem about uh idealism and the, looking up in the clouds and not taking notice of the reality of what's below you, you know, chasing the dream and forgetting the dream has consequences. I, I just want to reiterate, this is not like a judgment or damnation of any individual at all. Mm. It's a comment on a kind of process and it's not um, a separation of myself off. It's um, a, a comment on the whole arts industry thing. Cool. But, you know, um, we're doing some of that now in a sense. And um, I'm glad we're doing this now. I think this is a good thing to be doing. So, you know, th this isn't a judgmental issue. This is an awareness issue. Uh, and no, I certainly would never take any money, not only from, but from mining industry. The I, closest I have had come to this problem is twice in my life, and then I'll finish off. But once was in the um, late 90s, where I had a play put on, a verse play put on in Cambridge and found out, you know, two days before it was coming on, that uh, a mining company um, in Britain uh, had an office in Britain had donated money to the company that put it on, and I saw it next to my name on the flyers and had an absolute meltdown, and said that will never ever happen again, and um, I didn't receive any financial benefit from it at all, but it's still associated, and that really upset me and made me very aware. The second time was when I did um, a commission to write poems on an art exhibition and it was funded by a very big company and the, they own most of the art if not all of it and I wrote a disclaimer against the company which I insisted published was published along with my poems which they did and I got a note indirectly via someone from the CEO saying to bite the hand that feeds you how ungracious and this seems you know why would you treat and I wrote you know basically they can said because you know you're all it's, it's terrible where you go and art shouldn't be owned by anyone. It should be, you know, these are public works of art as far as I'm concerned. So that disclaimer went in and I donated a chunk, not all of it, but a chunk of the money I got from it to um, various causes. But so that that was another time that happened. So it happened, that was a long, long time ago, but that happened to me twice. 
Um, and I know it happens, you know, people go to festivals and they turn up and find out, you know, something like Woodside's put money into it or something like that. And they're at a loss what to do. Well, you don't do it again and you speak out against it. There's the answer. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, but, you know, people have got to live and I think you can get funding in more, you know, I think taxpayer funding is probably about the best you're going to get or, you know, those kind of bodies that make money off books themselves, those kind of things um, are about as good as it's going to get. And you can, if you're lucky enough to get any of it, you can live a bit longer. But uh, that's a, so that's dragged that into a very murky area. But I think it's an area we need to talk about. It's something that needs discussing how we're funded, if we are funded, if we're lucky enough to get funding, how that is. And the same applies to universities as well, because uh, where that money comes from and which part of the university and all that. Mm. Same issue. Well, there's an enormous amount of food for thought in this book. Um, thank you so much, John, for sharing your poems and your experiences and thoughts and insights on, on the theme of environmental, human and animal rights through poetry and, and a whole bunch of other themes too, we'll, <laughs> as we talked about them. Uh, details of some of John's books will be posted with this podcast, so please look out for them together with the link to his blog with poet Tracy Ryan. Uh, we will return in a month or so with Ellen Van Nieven on the theme of coexistence. See you then. Ellen's great, so that'll be a fabulous show.